Hi, and welcome to another edition of Newsmakers. I'm Jerry Roberts. It is Friday, April 8, and we are joined by our all-star panel of top local journalists, Gwen Lurie, editor-in-chief of the Montecito Journal, Josh Molina, international man of mystery and a political writer for Newshawk, Ryan P. Cruz, City Hall reporter for Independent, and June Starkey, staff writer for The Independent. Thank you all for coming. Let me just say a word about COVID. It looks like we are moving to the endemic stage since half the people around the president in the United States uh, now have tested positive that we're all gonna just learn to deal with it. 182 new cases in the last week, that's three per 100,000, which is pretty good, 675 deaths. Uh, so, you know, it still looks kind of optimistic and um, several boards and commissions or maybe everybody returned to in-person meetings this week. Did anybody, Except uh, huh? Except for Josh, did, Josh, did you go to a meeting? I did not go to a meeting. The city council did not meet this week, and the school board did not meet this week. So, I um, I didn't have any meetings that I would normally go to to be at. So, did you eventually go to a I'll return? Uh, I'm not in person yet. I'm I'm still waiting to go to in person. Um, it, it's a big change because a lot of people uh, started to become more engaged in the city when everything was available online. Uh, you saw a lot of people in public comments uh, through Zoom who might have otherwise. You know, had to had to work, and that might be a problem going forward to to see if those people aren't going to be able to participate in the same way. Um, if they're going to offer sort of like Alita, where it's going to be a hybrid, um, it sounds like it's just going to be except for city council and a, a couple the uh, a couple of the finance committee, ordinance committee. Um, other than that, it sounds like it's going to be in person. Uh, yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, and June, one thing that um, lots of people always turned out uh, for, whether it's on Zoom or uh, in person, is uh, tenant issues. And uh, you had a story this week about some new state legislation that uh, extends some benefits for tenants. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, so it's for people who have already submitted um, a request for rental relief um, on or by March 31st. Um, so for those people, and I think um, Monique Limon said it was like between 160 and 190,000 households that have already submitted that, but those people are going to be protected from eviction until um, June 30th because they're, they have a lot of uh, a backlog of people submitting for relief and they have to give ample time to, to dole out those funds. Yeah, and uh, in terms of uh, the city, what what's going on with rent control or is causes having a big uh, demonstration? Yes. Yeah, ne next Tuesday, they're having a demonstration. Uh, them and I believe the Democratic Party of Santa Barbara are having a, a demonstration for uh, rent control. Um, I think they feel that it's gone back and forth too many times. Um, I think even asking for the, the study they felt was unnecessary to a certain degree because um, a lot of people are aware that there is a rent problem in Santa Barbara. A lot of people can't afford uh, to live here. A lot of people are moving out of the city. You know, they, they get pushed to Goleta and Ventura and then out into Lompoc and uh, Carpinteria. And I think that a lot of people are just um, sort of tired of waiting for them to make that decision. Yeah. Um, Josh, are there, are there four votes for rent control? And wh when does the study come back? Do we know? I think it's on the council agenda the, the 19th. This is the 12th. So I think it's supposed to be on council the 19th, which is why there's so much energy around the, the uh, rent uh, stabilization. I think they're calling it. They're not calling it control. There's going to be a walk uh, Tuesday night at five o'clock. So um, we're going to get that first report back in sort of the latest discussion. I don't know that there's four votes. Uh, Randy is obviously the swing vote there, and he does have some influence now that Kathy Morio did not. So I think that whatever direction they go is, is not going to be the red control that the advocates want. It's not going to look like what it looks like in other cities. So I think it's going to be a good issue. I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I, I would, betting money says, says I would be surprised if they pass some sort of rent stabilization ordinance just because it's a really controversial issue and our mayor I don't think is a favorite of it. No I don't think he is either. Um, 
All right. Well, uh, the other thing the uh, council, uh, big story about the council was with it. If um, the independent committee finally finished the uh, redistricting of um, council districts, and it sounds like they didn't make a lot of changes. Uh, Brian. The, the new map is, is it still meets the 50% minority uh, citizen voting age population. Um, that was kind of the main reaction to the, the census because a few of the numbers changed in districts one and, and three, the east side and the west side were the, the districts with the most Latino population. So those were the districts where they were kind of concentrating on how to keep that at the 50%, which is uh, with the Voting Rights Act and with the the everything that was happening legally, they have to have two majority minority districts. And that was mainly the east side and west side that a little couple blocks were changed here and there. And uh, some people were, were, were spoke at the meeting because the, the west side now is just at that 50 mark. And actually in Latino, it's at 43, but that's the voting age. So it's still 63 to 64% Latino in, in the west side district overall, but the voting age is just at that 50%. Um, there wasn't any, big changes, but I think what this kind of means overall is that the city is slowly losing its its Latino population and becoming, you know, more welcoming to higher paid and, and mostly white people from out of town. And it's kind of outpricing in, in these districts, especially in the west side and east side. And in the future, you know, that, that population, if it continues to go down and we have to have these two minority majority districts, it's going to be a little harder to, to draw those lines later on. Yeah. Gwen, I've only lived here for 20 years and I still don't understand what parts of Montecito are uh, represented by the city and, and which by the county. What, 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 what is it just Coast Village Road in Montecito? Actually, that's, just the south side of Coast Village Road. Oh, well, and that's it. Josh, am I correct on that? I don't know. I always the thought it was of, all of Coast um, Village Road, but I don't know. I just, I just always say Coast Village Road is in the city. I, yeah, gosh, never... I hope I'm not wrong, but my understanding is the south side of Coast Village Road, although, you know, I might not be right because I know the Vaughn's Country Mart is included. Yeah. Um, and but so it may I, be I think it's just Coast, Coast Village, Village Road. Road to the ocean. And uh, who, and that's Kristen Snedden yeah. represents it. Yeah. So do you, I mean, do, is she very, visible in in kind of looking after uh, issues yeah. over there yeah i think she she's been really involved um in this business improvement district issue i think she has a strong relationship with the coach village coast village association um and you know other sort of leaders in her part of montecito she's 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 around for sure yeah Josh, the, and, uh, in terms of the District 3 thing, you you talked to Oscar, who was uh, appeared unhappier in your story than he did in Ryan's story. Uh, maybe it was just the time. time I, I get people to open up a little bit more. Oh, is that what it is? Uh, but uh, so the District 3 thing is, I'm still a little confused. It's a majority minority district, but not majority Latino district. And he sees this as a uh, evidence of gentrification. Well, I, um, I will say overall, uh, Oscar and the people who were involved with the new maps are in support of them. Um, there wasn't a lot of controversy. The three judges from LA and uh, Ventura County, they were charged with overseeing these maps. And honestly, it was the community who kept pushing back and saying, no, 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 no. Lanny Evanstein was involved, Sebastian Aldana, Oscar, Kristen Snedden, several other people. And the judges were really res uh, responsive to those concerns. So what the issue was, was that the population has shifted such that the district was no longer 50.1% voting age Latino. And so now it's dropped to 43% voting age. It's still 50.1% people of color, okay? So that's African-American, that's Asian, that's any, you know, that's a group of people who are non-white. So it is, those are, those people are included. So it's still a majority minority and you have to have two. So we have one and three, 
who are in that so case. I'll, I'll but I'll Oscar's wondering. point was was to the larger narrative, what Cause has been talking about, which is they have the data and they've done the study that says we are seeing Latinos moving out of Santa Barbara at higher rates than in the past because of the escalating rents. And so, you know, he had talked to me, you know, he said he's lucky. He lives with his mother. He lives in his mother's house. He hasn't been driven out of Santa Barbara like a lot of his friends, quite frankly, like a lot of my friends, probably a lot of Ryan and June's friends, people who grew up here who can't afford to live. My parents were renters. We never owned any property. It wasn't until I got married that I was able to own property. That's not an option for everybody. And some people can't afford to just buy a house here. And so his point was, this is the overall issue. We, things are getting too expensive. And he said, he just sees it anecdotally while he's walking on the, on the West side. Well, it also dovetails with the traffic issues, right? Because it's really hard for people to live in Ventura and Lompoc and other places and work here because it's so hard. Even CARP is hard to get to. Yeah. Okay. During yeah, I think I think there is a, a big issue with the, the housing prices, and that's really making it hard for, like Josh said, people that live and grew up here to stay here. And I, I see people that, you know, went to school, high school with me, and they get jobs and they can't stay in Santa Barbara anymore because it's just, you know, it's outpriced. And so there is something to be said of that, but um, we do kind of have to, it, it ties into that to everything with housing and rent prices. And it's kind of the trend going going that way with the census. And that's what kind of they, they drew this. And one of the big wins in Oscar's district is I think that he got the West Side Community Center now in his district. It, uh, they redrew the line. So it stretches on that a little six block stretch on Castillo. So now the West Side neighborhood uh, is, is actually in the West Side district. Um, so there's a, a few small changes. I think, like Josh said, that the committee for being out of towners, they did a really good job of listening to at least the people that did show up. There wasn't a lot of public um, input, but there was a lot of community um, associations and things like that, that that had input and let them know like, hey, this needs to be in this district just to make sure it, it wasn't something that didn't really match our neighborhoods and districts at all. Yeah. Gwen, and your, your representative attended all the meetings or most of the meetings and noticed on several of the maps that she was out of her district and uh, <clears throat> provided her feedback. So everybody on the council, all the incumbents are now in their districts. Nobody got pushed out uh, like happened with Congress and uh, uh, the legislature. Kristen Sneddon was districted out in one of the original yeah, early exactly. maps That's by Lanny Ebenstein. Said, yeah. Yeah. And they brought they brought her in. East Beach was almost taken out of Alejandra's district. Yeah, district that was one. that was a big one, definitely. The East Beach, so, um, they had they had to take a little portion of, of the east side out of the east side to kind of keep East Beach in East Side because they, they couldn't keep that and also the, the top corner over there by Valerio and Coda. Yeah. By the way, I, I was one who really was upset about the loss of the East Beach grill, but um that restaurant that's in there, which name escapes me now is really good um that was the first time i went to lunch with uh since in two years with joy studley there it was very nice um all right uh gwen um you're you're wearing multiple hats in this story uh the uh project for a resilient community which uh there you go um <laughs> Uh, was responsible for raising the money and, and pushing through the permits to uh, put ring nets um, uh, in several of the uh, uh, places where the debris flow was, was very heavy, yeah. uh, won a national award. And you were part of that group, but- um, you, you wrote a great story about that for the prized Montecito Journal. Well, yes. Well, you 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 contracted with that talented young journalist Jerry Roberts, so that was that was quite good. But the interesting thing, the most. I hope you got paid what you're worth, Jerry. He did. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not going to say anything about me. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. It was right there. It was like a slow ball right down the middle. Oh, I know. But uh, among the other things that the project has done is this new 166-page uh, report about similar uh, uh, events to the uh, 2018 
uh, debris flow, the, the one nine debris flow. And if you read it, two things really jump out at me. One, this is, you know, it's not like a big outlier. Everybody was saying, oh, it's a one in a thousand year event or something. And, and the other is that the flood control uh, system that Montecito is orders of magnitude too small to, uh, to protect against something like this. What, what's the group gonna do with this report? What's the next steps, Gwen? So, so here's the kind of general story. So there's a woman named Sarah Anderson, who's a political scientist at Bren at UCSB, who's done a lot of work on something called disaster salience, which basically shows a negative correlation between risk and awareness, let's say, right? So right after an event, when the danger is the lowest, right? The awareness is the highest. And as you move further away from the event, the awareness goes down, but the risk goes back up. So this is a challenge for every community. After um, the debris flow, as you were saying, Jerry, Geo certain local geologists and you know we're, we're throwing out ridiculous statistics like this was a one in 500 year one in a thousand year event and that was comforting but it was also Wrong. misleading and frankly irresponsible <laughs> my personal opinion um, and tprc at the time reacted uh, by trying to come up with an immediate way to give comfort to the community as we were living through the five years post debris flow as the, you know, um, re mountain revegetation. All the vegetation was burned off. And yeah. Right. Um, and so we raised money to put those six nets up on the mountains, but we knew that there was no long range plan in place whatsoever. There was no, no one had an idea of what we were going to do long term. And so the TPRC over time decided that it wanted to oversee research um, based on which the county can create a master plan because we need a, a master strategic plan. And so with the help of certain donors who are remaining anonymous to this um, moment here, um, you know, has commissioned a report by Larry Garola. This is the report you're talking about, right? An independent geological engineer and this guy, Dave Rogers from University of Missouri um, uh, Science and Tech Department um, to determine the history of flood, fire, debris flow. And, you know, since 1820, what did they say? Like 41 pretty major yeah. events have occurred. Yeah. Um, so that's 41 events in 200 years. And, you know, TPRC doesn't have a point of view. Um, they want to do the scientific research and let the chips fall where they may. And, of course, anyone who saw JAWS knows that, you know, when you tell people the truth, it creates fear. It can decrease property values. And, you know, that's what folks are afraid of. Um, including and, and maybe most of all elected folks. So yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. so what so your supervisor, Supervisor Williams, uh, is he um, open to this master plan thing? Is there going to be a push for this? I mean, I think we feel like they're open to it. I think we feel like they have to be open to it. You know, there is a lot of research going on, not just in Santa Barbara. UCLA just came out with a report. Scientific America just came out with a, uh, a report on natural disaster, disaster showing that the risk in California for such disasters is up 100% moving forward. And it's up like 700% in the Pacific Northwest. So we're really in a, a dangerous situation. And but with technologies like LIDAR and advanced weather monitoring, I think we can do much better planning, much better at you know, informing people so they can get out of the way in, in a case like a major event like what happened. Um, and we can keep the community more informed. But just one other point I want to make is interestingly, you know, Kevin Taylor, who is the fire, fire chief here in Montecito, he got it. He understood what was possible on those days and that that period before this event, the 2018 debris flow. And he spent a small fortune on bringing swift water re rescue team here, military teams here, and which, you know, 
is told to have saved probably 200 lives. If yeah, this yeah. event hadn't happened, it would have looked like he wasted money. <laughs> yeah. But because it did happen, what most people don't know is he's like a huge hero for- Oh yeah, he's a, and I'm really a, a very um, Great guy. talented professional guy. And, I, and also a, a, a viewer of uh, newsmakers. So- um, oh, he's exceedingly intelligent. Uh, so we were talking about stuff that's returning to normal. Uh, June uh, Deltopia was back um, uh, last week, last weekend. Um, were you out there or no. were you uh, just... No, uh, I didn't want to go. I, you know, because the, the, on Twitter, it looked like there, well, there was a mass casualty event, you know, which got picked up by all the national media, but it, they need to yeah. change that. They need to change that name. Yeah, they need to communicate that a little bit better because I, I, I understood. I understood what it meant, but I feel like any normal person who reads that is going to think, you know, ten people died at Deltopia, um, but it wasn't as bad, obviously, as as years before. Um, even you know, the years following the the twenty fourteen riots, but um, it was definitely more than these past two years with COVID. Um, in 2020, there wasn't even a Deltopia, maybe 30 people showed up, uh, 2021, it was a little bit bigger, but this year, I think, um, you know, because the, uh, a lot of the mandates have been lifted, a lot of the protections for COVID have been lifted, and, uh, obviously classes are back in person, um, people felt a little bit more safe coming out and, you know, partying on Del Playa, but I think the, the biggest thing was, a, a girl fell from a second story window, um, hurt herself pretty badly. Um, a couple other people, I think a, a few had to be like helicopter lifted because it was so dense with people that it was impossible for um, emergency responders to get to the people that were injured. So they had to be, you know, strapped down and airlifted out. Um, but it was mostly just a couple of broken bones, um, nothing too too serious, not a casualty. All right. So a minor mass casualty yeah. uh, <laughs> event. And Josh, they're, 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 Bringing back solstice also, um, but changing the the route. Obviously, can't go down State Street uh, anymore. Um, any any controversy about that, or everybody's pretty happy? I don't know. I know that the people on the promenade want to keep their outdoor dining, so I'm sure this is a good compromise. I haven't done any firsthand reporting on that issue, but long term. I think it's part of the conversation as to why outdoor dining, according to some, should be portable because you're going to need to have solstice downtown. There aren't a lot of restaurants on Santa Barbara. Is it Santa Barbara Street? Santa Barbara Street, yeah, I think. There aren't a lot of re restaurants, not, certainly not the same concentration as on state. So they won't be getting that same um, sort of uh, benefit from it. So Portability, I think, is the way it's headed so that we can see these parades return to downtown. Yeah, all right. And then um, you, and Nick's not here to uh, to hear me say that you stomped him on the uh, on the big bird refuge shocker. Uh, what uh, the stink from the uh, from the bird refuge is is going to be a thing of the past. I prefer to just say we're we're all working together in this community, Jerry. So we don't have to point out scoops. It's very 1980s Chicago. It really uh, is, Jerry. I agree with Josh. If if Ryan has a story on a Monday, maybe I didn't want mine to run till Thursday. Oh, maybe yeah. or maybe <laughs> or maybe they sat on it too. Or maybe Josh has something different to say about it. Yeah, maybe I I got Oscar to say things, you know. <laughs> All right, uh, talk about the bird refuge. Hey, Gwen, does, does that smell from the bird refuge uh, get o get to Coast Village Road? Is it a problem in Montecito or not? You think that's why I'm fanning myself? <laughs> really? No, okay. no, that's I've never cannabis, I've Jerry. never smelled it on Coast Village Road. I've certainly smelled it, uh, you know, near the dining the water. Yeah. yeah. So what, what, what are they going to do, Josh? Uh, well, the Andrew Clark Bird Refuge is a great sort of visual paradise. It's, it looks beautiful when it's full and nice. There's ducks there. There's birds. It's a place for people to go and sightsee, relax. And uh, it's, a, it's a landmark, right? It's one of the great uh, treasures of Santa Barbara. But every now and then, uh, there's this algae bloom when the water's stagnant, and it creates off this 
this rotten egg smell. And for years, the city just sort of let it go away and pass. And then they finally had some money to sort of invest into trying to fix the problem. So I'm not a scientist. Um, and when trying to explain the story, even talking to the environmentalists at the city who are trying to explain it, there's lots of moving parts. But essentially, what they're going to do is get the water circulating. Uh, it doesn't circulate right now. There's a broken weir underground that is supposed to allow water to flush from the ocean into the refuge uh, when there's high tide. So there's supposed to be some circulation. We don't get enough rainfall for it to flow. It's also a place, it's a watershed. We're, we're uh, downhill, downstream, it's supposed to get water from uh, Montecito and uh, above, but it hasn't been happening. And so they are going to make these changes to circulate the water and hopefully get rid of this issue. And also they're putting up some new fences to block the homeless. Uh, they're going to take out some of the grass. Um, so there's also some aesthetic changes that they're doing there. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's an important thing for them to do because that's such a treasure in Santa Barbara place. to It was, so, it was so hard for restaurants like Stella Mare who Yes. Well, couldn't even eat outside during the pandemic. Yeah. Are they still there? Did they survive? Yeah, good. Okay. All right. Uh, so, uh, Ryan, what are you working on? Well, next week we got a, I got a big uh, cover feature on uh, Milpas and Milpas Street, Milpas oh, good. whole area, um, kind of a, a deep dive on what's happening over there, kind of how it came to be. Um, some of the, the businesses we have over there and what's it looking like in the future because we're applying for uh, some safety improvements on the, and the crosswalks and the lighting fixtures out there. Um, we were denied in 2020. So Jessica Grant is kind of working with the community to put together a, another grant application for this 2022 round. And uh, we're hoping that we can, you know, it, it's a, a really busy street and everybody knows about it. Everybody goes there to eat. Everybody goes there to get whatever they need, but you know, it, the, the street, the sidewalks, if you walk them, there's, there's not, yeah, I mean, if you're on a wheelchair, there's not where, it, yeah. It, it hasn't been the attention, nearly the attention, of, obviously, that State Street gets. Yes. June, what yeah, are you so working definitely on? Definitely keep a lookout for that uh, next Thursday. All right. June, what are you working on? I'm covering the, the vigil next week about uh, rent control and, and trying to go a little bit more into why, um, you know, a lot of people feel a certain way about it and might feel that it's unnecessary, but a lot of buildings in Santa Barbara that rent to people are under 15 years old. And so they're not um, subject to the state statute for rent control. And, you know, however people might feel about it, it's, it's really unempathetic to not understand the plight of people who like can't afford to live here, you know, and, and there's, there's always this argument that like, you know, you don't, you know, I read all of our Instagram comments. So it's always, you know, why do you want to live in Santa Barbara? Then why don't want you to go somewhere less expensive? And yeah, duh. But <laughs> People grew up here and they want to live here. And I don't think that's unreasonable. Yes, the Ernie Solomon Brigade uh, <laughs> on that one. And Gwen, uh, your big news, uh, you published uh, a new magazine, a new design magazine. We're going to talk about it on the show more uh, next week. But just uh, can you just preview that a little bit? Yeah, the RIV uh, created and edited by Les Firestein. Um, and uh, I guess full disclosure, my husband, um, but is a longtime writer and designer and uh, had a dream about doing a magazine about architecture and design that had real substance because there are very few of those around anymore. And so he created this, it's called The Riv. It is um, design and architecture in the American Riviera and basically a blueprint for Riviera living. So we write about Rivieras all over the world, including Mogadishu, um, Ibiza. Uh, we have really interesting local stories. And uh, I think it's a beautiful magazine, 292 pages long. Oh, a lot of advertising, I'll bet. So, Josh, the uh, Montecito Journal media conglomerate continues to grow. Um, and and you're trying to make us all fight with each other. How could you? All right. What about scoops. What's, what's going on with the, the, the uh, podcast? 
Uh, so I have the judge, Frank Ochoa, on my show. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, district elections, and he was part of the original team to push for them, and he was closely involved with the redistricting. We're also going to talk about Juana Flores, who was a longtime Lita resident who's back in the U.S., but they're still fighting to get her permanent uh, status to stay here in the country. And uh, we'll touch base on a few topics. So yeah. looking forward to that conversation. Yeah, the judge is a great man. Um, all right. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, Gwen Lurie, uh, Josh Molina, Ryan P. Cruz, June Starkey, thanks for taking the time to check in. Thank you for watching. And we'll see you next time on Newsmakers.